Captains of Industry, brought to you by Airtel. Welcome back. We're talking to Sir Martin Sorrell, the founder of WPP, the world's largest advertising and marketing group. If you were to start WPP today, how would you do it differently? Um, probably be very much more digitally driven, obviously, with a bit the benefit of hindsight. Probably faster growing market driven as well. You know, instead of it being 30% of our business, in both cases it is now, we'd want it to be at least half. Um, probably more content driven. Probably uh, more media owner, um, I was going to say media owner friendly, but I don't mean that because we are media owner friendly, but I mean uh, just more media owner. We would walk equally with media owners as with clients because I think the opportunities for branded content, sponsored content, sponsorship as a whole, those whole sort of areas, sports rights, etc., are much bigger uh, than they were 26, 26 years ago. Uh, could we do that in a, the same way, you know, buy a, buy a wire basket manufacturer and make uh, what some would call hostile takeovers in the first couple of years of our activities? I, th I think there are still possibilities out there. Market anachronisms in the market or um, anomalies in the, the market are probably more difficult to find because the markets, the stock markets, are much more fluid now. I mean, there's an issue about whether the valuations are right now, I guess. But they're much more fluid, and therefore you don't get the, as many anomalies as you used to uh, in my time, uh, my girl, <laughs> when, when I was young. Um, you know, with, uh, the fact that you could buy a company like JWT, which was almost 150 years old, 125 years old. I mean, you're bound to, if you buy a company which has that pedigree, you're bound to find hidden treasures, either intangibles or tangibles. In our case, it was a tangible that people had sort of either ignored or forgotten about. It was ba bound to be the case because, you know, your, your attitude if you start with nothing is very different to somebody who starts with, you know, a 125-year-old company. So I think it would be it would be different. Uh, it would have the obvious geographic and functional differences. There might be a structural difference, as I say, with private being being public. You know, running a public company, I find interesting. You get involved in stuff like this and dealing with institutions and you know, I spend a third of my time probably with clients, a third internally and a third externally. But, but having said that, um, you know, the public markets have become more complicated and, and private equity and private equity financing uh, can be uh, interesting or even more interesting, uh, particularly to management. So I think it's sort of an I interesting difference in times. You're the founder of an advertising empire. How do you lead it? Uh, with difficulty, the answer, but that's for others to say. I mean, I, I'm, people accuse me of being a micromanager. I, I regard that as being a compliment rather and than a bean, an insult. And a counter as well. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, as Jeremy Bullmore said, said to me, you know, or said, Martin doesn't enjoy uh, counting beans. He is a bean counter, and the more beans he counts, the more he likes. That, that's when people are trying to be, be, be nasty or I irritating. I'm not an accountant. Not that there's anything wrong with accountants went to business school, and, and uh, that may be even more of a problem than being an accountant. Uh, I've always regarded myself as being a businessman. I mean, in our industry, people regard it as being a craft, and to some extent it is, but it's increasingly becoming a science, which makes a lot of people uncomfortable. It is a business. Uh, I mean, it's, it is not uh, just, just an art and a craft. There is an art and craft piece to it. But we have to, you know, your questions of me about what we're doing in Africa or the Middle East, or Latin America, or China, or wherever it happens to be, we have to mimic the activities and copy the activities and focuses of companies that are far bigger than us. Uh, you know, our, our big clients, whether it's uh, Ford, or Unilever, or Procter & Gamble, or Nestle, or J&J, &J, or Microsoft, whoever it happens to be, we have to mimic the activities and structures and organizations of companies that are far bigger, far better resourced, uh, far better physical plant than we are. So it's quite a difficult thing thing to do in a, in a personal service business, particularly in a non-inflationary environment where clients don't have, particularly packaged goods clients don't have pricing power, where retail is growing in power and putting pressure on the manufacturers. So it's quite, these are quite interesting and challenging times. I mean, I'm not complaining about them. I just think they, they offer great challenges. So leadership s style, you know, that's for others to evaluate. When you found something, you are fundamentally different to somebody who manages it. Namely, I love Bill Shankly's quote, you know, football's not a matter of life and death, it's more important than that. 
and WPP is not a matter of life and death, but it's more, more important than that. And then when you're a founder, and I only own a minuscule amount of stock in WPP, a couple of percent in WPP, um, when you're a, a founder, your emotional connection to the business is obviously different than, than if you come in, you know, to turn around a company or you're hired to run a company. And I liken it to, to, to it's the nearest a man can come to giving birth, <laughs> mentally, not physically. <laughs> Have you ever considered any other profession? Uh, yeah, I wanted to open the batting for England. But, uh, you know, I was very, very boycottian. I was, not, uh, I was not flamboyant in any way whatsoever. So no, I don't know if that was probably about the only other profession I fancy to do. But I have bold Mike Proctor, so I have some claim to South African fame. <laughs> Looking back, do you wish that there was something that someone had told you when you first started off? Um, it's an interesting question. Well, it, uh, listen, you always, you, you always make mistakes. And, and if anybody to, you know, certainly I wouldn't admit what they were, but you certainly made mistakes. I mentioned one, which was the, fun the funding of the Ogilvy acquisition in 1989. Um, you, know, you always wish you had more advice. I mean, my father was, uh, until he died in 89, was probably my closest advisor. I then had a lawyer in New York from, from that, where he'd been an advisor before. But uh, until he died of cancer also in uh, the early part of this millennium in 2000, 2001. Um, and it's always good to have somebody outside the business who doesn't have an agenda or appears not to have an agenda to give you advice as a sounding board. I think, that, I think that's very important. So I, th I think the answer to the question is, you know, is there anything specific? You know, is it like the graduate and plastics, my boy? No, it isn't. Um, I don't think there was any sort of eye-popping, eye-opening thing. But I think it is very valuable to have somebody that you can talk to, probably not in the business, outside the business, who can be as objective as possible about decisions. Because you know everybody inside the organization tends to filter things. I mean, it's true that well, people will tell you what you want to hear, and they won't tell you what you don't. You know, it's like good news travels fast, but bad news doesn't. And I'd all rather, always rather hear the bad news first rather than the good news so we can deal with it. By the time bad news gets to you, it's too late. Um, so there is an element of that. But I don't think, no, I don't think there's a specific, there must be some stuff that I would love to have known a few years ago. But it's not that. That's not the fundamental thing. It's the ability to listen to somebody who can give you some advice that can be, that can be valuable in the context of a situation you might be in an opportunity or problem that you're looking at. When you put your head on your pillow at night time, what bothers you? And that's the question I ask everybody else. I mean, I, I, I think you know, if you said to me now, if you're asking about now, um, obviously what's going to happen in the economy, because the business has done very well, but I'll get the September results in a couple of days. And I, you know, who knows, given you know, the gloom that there is in the world. I mean, it, the, the marginal car is not house, uh, vacation is not being bought by the consumer. The, the marginal hire is not being made by corporate. So, I think this gloom that you, CNBC, is solely, solely responsible for. Now, you're not solely, but the gloom that, that gets talked about on squat box every morning um, obviously will have an impact, must have an impact at some point in time. So I worry about the general economic. Uh, I worry about uh, uh, our ability to penetrate these fast-growing markets. I worry about our ability to... I'm not so worried about that because I think we have got a superb market position. We've got a very strong market position in digital very strong competitively. I want to do more of that. And I worry about the application of technology to our business. How do we deal with the Google? Are they a frenemy? Are they a friend or an enemy? If they're a frenemy, you know, how do we deal with it? And how do we position ourselves in relation to a Facebook and a Twitter and whatever else might be coming down the pipe? Uh, and then how do we uh, you know, develop our an data analytical capability as well? Because data is becoming more and more available. Knowledge is no longer power. Everybody has the knowledge. You know. In Africa, uh, the fastest and, and most convenient way to access the internet is by mobile. And you can do that prepaid, and then we can do it all sorts of ways. So it really is, the, the knowledge is available. The marginal cost of information is zero. There might be some, some introductory cost, some fixed cost, but the marginal cost is zero, uh, or as close to zero as makes no difference. And that's changed the way the world, the world operates and the connectivity of people. So 
So keeping abreast of that. But I would say, uh, on balance, it, it's you know, our three strategic things are, gr are geogra around the geography, functionality, and the sense of digital and functionality in terms of data and technology. And those are the things that I, that I worry about. Now, your major investors were quite stunned to hear that you proposed to I didn't propose. That it was proposed, that your salary it's be not, not my increased. Hands. It's not my hands. <laughs> Bring your salary to 1.5 million pounds. Can you justify this? Well, I, it's not. I, I don't have to justify. I mean, it, it's. It, you know, we, we we do have, believe it or not, some some governance procedures, and the the compensation committee review these things. I, I don't think I've had an increase since two thousand and seven. I think it was and before that, not not since nineteen ninety nine. So oh. the, these are things. But I think the, the what the committee look at is the competitive stuff, and that question should be asked more of the competition <laughs> than it should be of me. I mean, the, the attitude towards compensation is, a, is a, an interesting one, and it varies by jurisdiction. You know, even the ISS varies in terms of what it, it does and how it looks at things in the United States and, uh, as opposed to the UK. So if you're a UK-listed company, you get a different part of ISS looking at it as opposed to the US part. The attitude of institutional investors to to Omnicom or IPG or Publicis, well, not so much Publicis because they're based in Europe, but you know, Publicis is half our size, uh, IPG is less than half our size, Omnicom is, is smaller than us, probably a little bit less complex, but you, you have to make those relative adjustments, uh, uh, judgments and adjustments. Having said all that, not my call, the call is it's up to the, the compensation committee at the end of the day. If that's the governor's <laughs> procedure, that's the one we follow. And they, they'll make the call and they'll make the decision. And lastly, have you ever considered retirement? Have I ever considered? No, they'll take me out one day and shoot me. You know, they'll, <laughs> they'll shoot me like the old horse or the old dog. You know, you, you've done enough damage, now go and go away. So, no, I mean, as I said, founders are uh, strange beasts. Maybe that's the right analogy, strange animals. And, um, you know, I enjoy what I do. And as I say, the, the emotional connection is very strong if you're a founder. I would say that you know, whoever it is that fol follows on, will, he or she will do a better job, I'm sure, than I do. But they'll do it very differently. And they won't do it with the same emotional connection. I mean, if you start something 26 years ago with two people in a room much, much smaller than this very luxurious room <laughs> in, this, in this hotel, uh, your attitude is bound to be different. You, know, you treat it as, as your own, not as somebody else's. That's all we have time for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Thank you. That was the ad man himself, Sir Martin Sorrell, founder of WPP. I'm Ashley Evans, and that's this week's edition of Captains of Industry.